Now I'm going to be speaking on a project that I've been working on for a couple of years. Um, and uh, the aim is to think about um, several areas of biology, um, research that we think is exciting, and the questions about meaning and purpose that it raises for us. Um, so in a sense, what we're doing is we're leaping over all the, the, the debates and the issues as such and landing in a place where I'd love for the whole of the science and faith in a perfect world where it would be, which is just reveling in science and enjoying it. And as a Christian myself, letting that help me to worship God and raise some questions for me. So um, whatever you believe, whatever you've come from, where, whatever level of uh, science you've studied, um, some or not at all, um, hopefully there'll be something for you um, in what I say tonight. Um, and uh, so I'll just tell you really briefly where we're going. I'm going to talk a little bit um, about whether faith can enhance science. Uh, can it go? I'm sorry, my text is slightly small, um, but never mind. <laughs> Skip through your eyes, probably. Um, can science enhance faith? Can it go the other way around? Um, two case studies about wonder in biology. I'm going to tell you two stories, essentially. Um, and then thinking about the questions of meaning and purpose um, that they raise um, and thinking about the compatibility of these stories of the existence of God. So that's where we're going. Um, so I'll start thinking about from faith to science. Uh, really briefly, um, I'm never quite sure how much exposure people have had to the science of faith conversation. So I always think it's good to give an introduction about where I'm coming from in that um, respect. So obviously there are lots of Christians um, in the past who have been scientists, um, nearly all of the founders of Western science anyway, so science in the West were Christians, people like Johannes Kepler, who included a lot of uh, prayers in his scientific writings. He wanted to be a theologian, first of all, uh, but he got off and offered this second-rate job as a natural philosophy professor, <laughs> which is what they call science. Um, and uh, eventually came to terms with that and realized that this could be his vocation. This could be his way of worshiping God. And he peppered his writings with his prayers and thought, theological thoughts. There's Robert Boyle, who was a well-to-do uh, Irish gentleman who um, did some science in his spare time, some very good science in his spare time, and was a very serious Christian. And of course, Isaac Newton, I've got to mention someone from Cambridge, who wrote more words of theology than science. I'm not sure we should read his theology, uh, we should certainly make the most of his science. Um, um, I haven't read any, that's not fair, I haven't read any, um, and he can't defend himself, but anyway, I'm sure he would if he was here. Um, and then I've got some living scientists, including a couple of women, just to balance things off. Um, Francis Collins, uh, one of my heroes, who was the leader of the Human Genome Project, uh, which is an international project, um, now uh, running the National Institutes of Health, the equivalent of the MRC um, in the US. Um, and, uh, and, and then a couple of astronomers, Catherine Blundell, who's a, a professor of astrophysics in Oxford, and Jennifer Wiseman, um, who is one of the chief scientific uh, people involved in the Hubble Telescope right now. So I was, as a student, I certainly find it tremendously encouraging to hear um, about the living scientists particularly, who I could look to, who were faithfully serving God in, uh, through um, doing their science as a Christian, and they saw that as part of serving God, but part, from, part of uh, their Christian uh, faith. Um, so that's kind of, in a sense, if I stopped now, <laughs> I'd have done my job, I think, but I'm not going to. Um, <clears throat> But certainly when I've gone into schools in the past, that's the one thing I want to get across. There are people out there um, who are doing this. Um, there have been big influences over the years from theology to science. There is our blue planet. Um, the idea that the earth is good and it's worth looking at and there's nothing there that can hurt our, hurt our faith. Um, it might challenge us to think um, that uh, came from Christian theology. Um, as people began to do science in this country, they had to defend what they were doing, the same as you have to defend any research here now. And people would, you know, this was one thing. Um, you could say also the idea 
um, well, this is certainly an influence that went in. There is a forest, it's a beautiful place, it's kind of a magical place. Um, it's an old growth uh, temperate rainforest in the north coast of, on the coast, west coast of Canada. Um, but only magical in a sense that it's really lovely, it's wonderful and it's great to explore. Um, there's not actually, there's nothing there that I have to not touch. Um, well, obviously I have to be responsible, um, but I don't need to worry. Um, there's no, I don't believe as a Christian that there's anything there that um, is going to upset God if I study it, touch it, taste it, try it. Um, so that frees me up to explore the world. And there's a brain scan. Now it's very obvious to us that if you want to understand the world, you have to investigate it, but that was um, a relatively new idea several hundred years ago, um, the idea that you have to get off your chair. You can't just do some logic and work from first principles. Um, and we have actually, I was going, there were some Greek philosophers who thought that, but thankfully there were other Greek philosophers who thought you did have to touch things, get off a chair and do experiments. And they were the ones who influenced the origin of science around the world. Um, and, and certainly for a Christian, from Christian theologians would, or certainly the early scientists here in this country would be saying, who are we to know how the world is put together? God did it whichever way he liked. We have to go and find, it, find out how he did it. Um, uh, last one, um, the beautiful picture of the universe. Um, and uh, not only is it stunning, but it's law governed by the laws of physics. Well, we call them laws because particles and atoms and light um, behave in law-like ways. Um, and investigating those laws was almost kind of like a step of faith. The scientists had to believe that there was um, a God sustaining the universe and that if they started touching and doing experiments, um, then they might find some regularities there because so far what they had learned about God made sense. There was um, what they saw in the Bible um, were being taught about a God who put in place seasons and stars and regularities. So they stepped out and tried to find other regularities in the world and they did. Um, so I don't think that's terribly disputed, the idea that there was an influence from theology into science, um, and I think it's really interesting to think about that. You could almost come up with a theology of science. Um, I think you've had Tom McLeish here, haven't you? Okay, so this comes from him in a sense, or I mean anyone who's a scientist or Christian would come up with this. Um, all creation is God's domain, it's something that we can investigate. Um, creation is very good comes from Genesis 1, if you add that to the equation, you also add humankind is called to serve and preserve the earth. You will hear about that uh, from Hilary Marlowe next year. And Genesis 2, if you come to that, add that all together and you get science as a form of worship, um, which is not something I had been told when I was a, a science student, but I would love to have known it because it would have given me another reason to work hard. I did work hard, um, but it would have given me yet another reason to work hard. And I have to have a quote from Michael Faraday because I work at the Faraday Institute. The book of nature which we have to read is written by the finger of God. So he was a Baptist, uh, preached in his uh, Baptist chapel in London and um, believed that what he was doing was uncovering God's works. So that is my, the way I put science and faith together. A great big Venn diagram. Sorry, that's what happens when you let a scientist loose. Um, <clears throat> So I've got Christianity is the biggest circle. So that, when I decided to follow Jesus, that was, that's it. That affects my whole life. Um, and then this isn't to scale, but if you're feeling a bit tired, it might be fun to have a go. <laughs> it's quite hard with circles, actually. You might have to start drawing other shapes. Um, try and see how things overlap. I didn't sleep in the lab. They don't overlap. Um, <laughs> but, and I don't work in the lab anymore, so science has got a lot smaller. Um, but all the other activities are there on the background of my Christian faith. So my behavior and my attitudes to things are the same. But there are other things that I don't do, wouldn't do in a lab. I wouldn't pray for a particular outcome for an experiment. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> Who am I to tell God how he should be running the universe? Um, I could pray that I do it well, please. <laughs> um, and when I go out of the lab, I don't get excited about people's diseases. I'm sad for them, they're sick. Okay, but now when I'm in the lab, I might find a disease terribly interesting and want to know all about it. But I don't take that attitude. Um, so they're out of the lab. So, you know, there are these different domains in life that I had different activities that are 
appropriate to them, but they all happen on the background of my Christian faith. And of course, when I'm in the lab, I might also pray for a colleague. I might even pray for them to get better if they're sick. Um, so I'm a whole person and I take that package with me wherever I go. Um, but certainly science is something I can do within uh, the realm of my Christian faith. <clears throat> And then is there any influence from science through back into faith? Um, I certainly <coughs> think so. And I could come up with a theology of nature, if you like. I don't often use the word nature. I, I more often use the word creation. Um, try and um, use that whenever I can. Nature often for people uh, means without God, but that's not what I mean here. Um, thinking of, I get this from Alistair McGrath, theologian um, from Oxford, who says, you know, if you use theology as a lens to look at the world, does it bring things into focus? Does it work? Um, I'm not thinking about proof for God. I'm not really thinking about evidence for God in this presentation I'm about to give. Um, that's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to ask, is science consistent with belief in a loving, powerful creator? Um, so that's a shift in thinking for some people, probably not for many in this group, and I, I don't know where people are coming from, but I'm not trying to make an argument for the existence of God. Um, I'm not trying to sort out the debates and the issues. They're tremendously important, and I'm so glad you've had other people coming to do that. But I'm trying to show, um, I'm going to show, that what we do in science is, is consistent with the existence of God. And what we experience when we experience beauty, wonder, or sometimes for a scientist, beauty often, I think, wonder often, that may be what gets a scientist into the lab in the morning, um, uh, or maybe occasionally um, when you've had a big day, <laughs> things have come together and you've let yourself relax and just enjoy looking at uh, the way the data are coming together. Or maybe when you see something for the first time, you might get that sense of, oh, that mountaintop moment. Where does that lead you? It might lead you, if you're a Christian, to worship God. What an incredible world you've made. Um, asking may make you ask some deeper questions. What's it for? Why is it like this? Science isn't going to answer those questions, um, but it might lead into a wider theological or philosophical conversation. So my own view, I'll just I'll lay it out there. Uh, I think... Christian faith or uh, theology as the lens does bring the world into clearer focus. Um, I am really keen on building bridges, starting new dialogues about science and faith, where we really are just getting excited about the science um, and the questions it points to. The big questions are incredibly important. I'll leave other people to deal with them. Some of us have to, have to do other things. Um, when it comes to the reason for my own faith, if you want to know, those are to do with the teaching of Jesus and what I see um, in my own uh, life uh, following him and what happens to the other people around me who are doing the same. Um, so you can ask me about that if you like. Um, and obviously science fits into that and complements that very well. So let's talk about wonders of the living world. I love taking pictures of little beasties. They stand still long enough. Birds are hard. Mammals are even harder, probably. But yeah, slug will sit still long enough for me to take a close up. Um, so my holiday snaps are always full of this kind of thing. Um, G.K. Chesterton was very keen on observation and wrote a really nice essay called Tremendous Trifles, where he asked, do we really notice this sort of wonderland that's around us? Very worth reading. But anyway, now I work with six Scientists, I always try to keep in touch with people who are actually getting their hands messy in the lab. Here they are, some Americans, some English people, uh, Brits. Um, this is a transatlantic project. And um, so I want to know about the deeper sense of wonder their faith gives them. That's one of the things I talk about in God in the Lab. You lose the ignorant sense of wonder, the wow, how does it work? You know, you lose that, but then you get this deeper sense of, oh my goodness, look how it works. <laughs> sense of wonder. The questions of meaning and purpose they raise um, and, and their own theology, they're Christians, um, how that fits in with science. So I'm going to tell you two stories from two of these people. The first one is a very familiar one, in a sense, about 
are, as it's not about humble beginnings, I apologize, that's the one slide I didn't change, it's about beauty. This is a very familiar story, this is you. This is the fertilized egg. This, the mother's and the father's DNA about to meet, come together to form a new potential person. And we know this story. We are familiar with different stages of it. Um, and out comes the baby in the end after a lot of time, a lot of hard work. Um, and this is Jeff Harden, professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, who does not study human babies. He studies worm babies. Um, and these very tiny worms, they live in damp soil. You probably have millions in your garden couple of millimeters long, millimeter, two millimeters long, and you can grow them on a little petri dish. You can look at them under a microscope. You can play around with them in a way that we really would never want to um, with our humans, and it'd be too, too expensive to do it with pretty much anything else apart from worms. And you can make them these bright colors, uh, lighting up different parts of their body. And much of the internal workings of their bodies are pretty much the same as ours. Their cells are doing the same things. They divide and move in the same ways as ours do. So you can learn a lot about, as, as Jeff says, with other models of car, you can learn a lot about a Rolls Royce by studying a Ford Fiesta, essentially. That's the idea. Um, so I'll introduce you to him. These videos I'm going to use, just a few, uh, scattered throughout the talk are rough cuts of some videos that we filmed um, from interviews with the scientists that I'm working with. Um, they do not contain animations or anything fancy. They contain pauses and even, um, yeah, they're not very slick. So I, I will apologize for them only slightly. The content is good. I'm going to show you some pictures afterwards um, that illustrate what he's saying. So I'll show you the pictures that went with that. <laughs> Here are some embryos. These are sea urchin embryos. These are the ones that got Jeff hooked on developmental biology in the first place. You can see the cells dividing, four, eight, I don't know, 16, 32. Um, and those cells, each cell will divide in two. So you get a doubling, a doubling, and doubling very quickly. You have thousands of cells. And here is a worm doing its thing, uh, developing. And so there is kind of like a Kaylee going on in here. You know, you, you all take hands and run towards another line of people. And one of the line of people has to drop hands and run through the arches and then pick them up again. Cells are doing very similar processes. That cellular glue he was talking about. Um, I'm not sure if that's what's highlighted here. It might be. This might be a gut, um, worm gut. Um, they're very beautiful. Um, but you can see those different cells all through its body. And so the glue is sticking them together or the Velcro is sticking them together and then it lets go. They might have to go off somewhere else in the body. They might form a sheet of cells all holding onto each other and some of them go in one direction and drag the sheet with them and make a hole. That's how the hole for your spine develops. Um, and so this embryo, these sheets of cells, and sometimes they let go and go through the sheets and form another sheet behind it, you know. So this embryo is kind of folding up like origami. I've got a wonderful book about how human embryos develop called Life Unfolding, and I don't like the title because life doesn't unfold, it folds up. Um, <laughs> a newborn baby C. elegans worm uh, has 959 cells. Somebody mapped them all. Uh, starting from one, dividing into two. Once they start to become specialized and become a muscle cell or a nerve cell, they kind of make this family tree of all the cells, where they go and what they do. Incredible amount of work, but it's made this an organism you really want to study for a biologist. Um, and there it is with other different parts of its body highlighted there. Um, and I'm pretty sure these are the junctions in between the cells that Jeff studies. Um, that are being highlighted here with these different colors. And there's a whole worm for you to see. Biologists often love the organism they're working on. They stare at it.
for days and months and years, and they come to really love it. You have to, otherwise you wouldn't do it. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, I think, largely. Um, okay, maybe symmetry, pattern, color, maybe universal, but do you think a worm is beautiful? I don't know what floats your boat. I think they're pretty cool. Um, I worked on zebrafish, so these little tiny zebrafish larvae I thought were incredibly beautiful. The room I worked in smelled badly fish, but the fish I think were beautiful. Um, and here's C. C. Elegans, Ala Andy Warhol. Okay, so he's, in the same way a photographer would use different colored filters when they take the picture, they'd use different colored filters on their microscope um, to show up uh, the different uh, colors there um, in the, uh, in this embryo, the different staining, different fluorescent colors uh, the cells have been stained with. Um, and certainly Jeff thinks this is very beautiful, it's very artistic. Um, okay, it's very geeky art. <laughs> but if you go to many biologist websites, if they're a very visual kind of person, they may have constructed a nice website with some really beautiful pictures. They might even have a gallery of their famous and favorite images. And Jeff certainly is very interested in beauty. That's something he's really thought about. So I worked with him on the God in the Lab book. He's one of the people in there as well. We worked on the chapter on beauty together. And uh, so I was really pleased to meet him and to find someone who also really appreciated and had thought and read about beauty in science and theology. Jeff is a slightly unusual scientist in that he studied theology. Um, he nearly became a pastor, so he, he or a minister, he went to a seminary um, in the middle of his studies and decided to go back into the lab. Um, but there is, he's thought about this a lot. And the idea of this material I've been collecting is that we produce a, um, a little study guide you could use for a small group study. Um, so you can have the videos of these guys and some discussion questions and also some uh, biblical input which some theologians we've been talking to as well um, that you can take away and delve deeper into that. But I'll tell you some of my thoughts on beauty. Um, the beauty of the world reflects the beauty of God, I believe that there's something uh, of the creator there in creation that you can, there's some kind of faint analog, uh, analogy between uh, what we see in creation um, and what there is to discover of God. Um, in the same way that if I created something or even my PowerPoint slides, you might be able to tell something about me from them. A little bit, not that much. You might get the wrong idea, um, but you might get something. Um, and certainly if you knew me as a person, they would confirm what you, what you knew about me, I would imagine. Uh, or if you read my book and you saw the slides, then you might think, yeah, I can see she really likes visual stuff. <laughs> I really know she likes nature, you know, she loves creation. Uh, you might learn a few things. So I think it's like that, uh, looking out at the world. And uh, just a quote, for the glory of God, the world was created. And only the person who is touched by a ray of this glory can learn to see the presence of God in Jesus Christ. A slightly provocative quote, maybe, from, from Balthazar, who is a Catholic theologian who um, is probably almost single-handedly responsible for getting uh, theologians looking at beauty again. He wrote this massive tome that I wouldn't attempt to read because um, certainly professional theologians say it's very difficult. So... I'll leave that to them. Um, I read a commentary on his work. It was very interesting. And this is an area um, that's been ignored for a while. And now people across all the different Christian traditions are thinking about this. What can we learn about God, about his beauty or about the glory of God from looking at creation, from looking at what he's made? I need to clarify here what I mean by creation. Um, because it has come to mean a certain uh, view of how God might have created, which was very quickly. Um, but I would like to claim it back in a more general sense. It's, it's the stuff right there. <laughs> That's creation. And I believe that came about. Um, God was sustaining this long, slow process. Um, a big bang, chemical, origin of life and chemicals, and evolution happened and produce all the wonderful things we see. 
That's what I mean by creation. But in the most general sense, I just mean the stuff, the stuff that's out there, um, the grass, the clover, um, the bushes. Now for Balthazar, if you're the kind of person who can appreciate that and be open to what it might tell you, even in a very general sense, look at the beauty, stop, enjoy, take a breath, reflect. What questions does it make you ask? The kind of person who's going to do that is going to be open to what God, um, who God is, um, and to encounter God through the person of Jesus Christ. Um, that's what I believe. Um, it's an interesting thought. Um, and of course, it can go the other way as well. Now I know God, I can appreciate what he's made even more. <laughs> Another way I think we can learn, sort of go from beauty to God, is about the order and interconnectedness of everything. Um, this is, it's so long since I took this picture. I think it's the Krebs cycle. Okay, maybe that's a little bit weird. But if you studied biochemistry, or any, any kind of science, you learn this slightly abstract process, but then it all slots together. Um, you know, if you understand how the periodic table was made, or even some of the, you know, the equations you learn in physics, what, what does everything, all those little numbers and letters, what do they mean? Why are they there? Why, you know, why are they laid out in that equation? You learn it and it slots together and it is beautiful in a way that it just sort of makes sense and it's satisfying. If you're that kind of geek, <laughs> it might make you feel a certain sense of uh, sort of peacefulness and it's satisfying. Um, and, you know, we now we also know things about the way the, the climate works, you know, all the, the circulation of air and water, um, heat, um, you know, this huge interconnected uh, globe, global forces or even down to a very, very tiny scale. Um, here you have lichen, which is not a single organism. It's an algae living inside a fungus. Um, and there are lots of different kinds of lichens, and lots of different algae, um, or yeah, different um, sun-eating bacteria, shall I say, um, as well as yeasts, actually, um, that come together to form this crusty stuff that can live pretty much everywhere. Um, probably one of the biggest survivors. If we have a nuclear war, we'll have what we have, um, what are those awful creatures? Um, his name is just popped out. Yes, that's the one, cockroaches and lichen, that's probably all we'll have. <laughs> um, but that satisfying order and interconnectedness um, for many people is a sign of God's power, of his wisdom, of his goodness, certainly. And I, I picked this idea up reading the Church Fathers, some of the earliest theologians. Um, and there's a wonderful book that put, pulled out the ideas from these guys and women as well, um, their ideas about studying the, the study increase and what can we learn about God from that. And this was one of the things they came up with. A more modern theologian, uh, Thomas Aquinas said, each creature manifests God in some way, but the best manifestation of God is the beautifully ordered universe of all creatures functioning in relation to one another as God intended. So take a lichen by itself and you might think, yeah, this respect reflects something of God's creativity. Take the lichen on the rock with some moss and some creatures and a person and all those things interconnecting in a good way um, can tell you more about, I think, about God's wisdom. Um, finally, and probably the least abstract, this might appeal to some more, God creating order out of chaos. We read in uh, Genesis and also uh, the beginning of the Gospel of John, God's word went out and boom, we started to have order happening. And the whole figurative account of that Genesis 1 to 3 is all about God bringing order out of chaos. And the story is incredibly ordered to demonstrate that. <coughs> These are snowflakes, and you can see the symmetry in the snowflake. And I tread very carefully because I know there are physicists in the room. But somehow, and I'm a biologist, the snowflake is symmetrical because the physical laws are symmetrical. As a woman called Emmy Noether came up with Noether's law that described that. Um, he did some work with Einstein, not 
one of his theories. Um, <clears throat> I certainly knew him. Uh, we were respected by him. And I loved that. It took me a couple of days to bend my head around it. And I mean, completely forgotten what I understood about this when I wrote about it. Um, but I remembered that fact that the laws of physics are symmetrical, which makes, produces symmetry all around us. Um, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, so when I see that symmetry, that can remind me um, about how God create, creates order out of chaos. So I'll finish this section um, by letting Jeff speak himself again about beauty and the questions and the things it makes him think about. Uh, when I interviewed him for the God in the Lab book, I gave these scientists the challenge. I said, I want you to tell me about your science and your faith. You're not allowed to talk about controversial issues. I don't want to hear about how you respond to criticisms of whether you can be a scientist in the faith. I just want to know what's cool. I just want to know what gets you excited in terms of being a Christian, being in the lab. Can it continue? I'll keep using some beautiful pictures, but we're going to look at another completely different biological topic. Um, and in the study material we're producing, you wouldn't normally do this, but um, because I'm here and we've got an hour, <laughs> um, I'm going to give you another one. So this is about how inevitable is the existence of life in the universe. This is the Milky Way, um, or part of it. And uh, this is an interesting question, not one I'd really thought about before I came to work at the Faraday Institute, but the number of people I've met who are working on this question. First of all, I need to give you a little bit of basic biology. If you want to build something on a construction site, you might go to look at the plans. You might write down a message um, about part of those plans, take that away, use it to help you put some building blocks together and those building blocks might turn into some kind of machine and that's exactly what happens in our body the dna code is copied into a little message called mrna it doesn't matter what it's called really the little message is taken off and used as a template is translated word for word almost um, into a string of molecules that are little tiny ones that are added together like beads on a string and they're called amino acids again they could be called anything it doesn't really matter and there's that string of beads is coiled up and turned into a useful protein that does something in your body maybe keratin protein in your hair maybe hemoglobin protein in your blood or maybe something that's involved in making something else like turning sugar into carbohydrate um, or the other way around um, I like that one out of dates. <laughs> That's what my gut's doing right now. And then to close the loop, the, the protein machines that are made can go back and take care of the DNA, repair it. Um, they can copy it every time a cell divides. That whole big string of DNA, it's actually two meters. Give me a minute to take that in. Two meters of DNA inside every cell that's too small mm. to see. It's ridiculously thin. Okay, and it's coiled up very, very tightly. Um, on a scale you could see, it's like getting several tens of kilometers of thread in a bath, which is actually pretty easy. You just wrap it around some bobbins and put it in, you know, and if you code the bobbins, you might even be able to find the, the one you need later on. And that's kind of what's happening inside your cells. Two meters of DNA in every cell. I'm digressing now, but I've got a little bit of extra time. And if you took all the DNA out of your body, stretched it out, you couldn't see it because it's so thin. Uh, added it end to end. Guess how far it would go? Way further than the sun. It would go to Pluto. <laughs> we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Quote <laughs> from the Psalms. Because we've already had Psalms. Anyway, so that's the process that's happening. And as an undergraduate, I had to work pretty hard to learn all the ins and outs of everything that was going on here and that was a long time ago so poor undergraduates now are probably learning even more about this process but I actually loved it once it all slotted into place I thought it was incredible I could understand these processes that were happening inside my cells at a scale I was far too small for me to see um, 
so accurately, so intricately. And not only that it's happening, that we, with our brains and our clumsy hands, it feels like when you're looking at the scale as small as a cell, we can understand it. It's incredible. Um, but anyway, that's the background to what I'm about to tell you. You get from a message, copy it, turn it into these things, which is what we're going to think about, the amino acids that are the beads on the string that are added together to make a protein. I'm going to introduce you to Stephen Freeland, uh, who was another person I met at the Faraday Institute. Um, he is one of those people who has a degree from both of the universities that make up Oxbridge, so you don't really need to remember which is which or which one he went to. Uh, so he went both of them. He's now in the US. He did some work for NASA for a while, uh, which sounded like fun on their um, Life on Other Planets division. And uh, he is very, very interested in this, the fact that every living thing shares this system, not just this system, but the exact same code, give or take some very, very tiny variations, which points to the fact that we have a common ancestor. Um, how did this code come about? So he used the word decisions when he talked about how life had developed early on. He doesn't mean an active decision. He means um, that origin of life from chemicals and that evolutionary process. Very early on, a very successful genetic code was arrived at. And he's interested to find out why. Uh, could it have been any different? Um, what would happen if you did it again? And these are the amino acids. I'm using Lego to illustrate them. There are hundreds of kinds of building blocks that you can use to make proteins. But our bodies and the bodies of every living thing, animal, plant, bacteria, whatever, use only 20. Again, give or take one or two tiny variations. I feel like I have to say that because they're biologists sitting on the front row. <laughs> Keep me right. Um, so that 20 is quite simple. Um, and in a sense, Stephen asked, well, here, here they are. They are all there in the 20, um, sort of cartoon of what they look like. Again, they're too small to see <laughs> with the naked eye. Stephen asked why these 20 out of all the hundreds that they could have been, why these 20? Is it like a well-chosen set of building blocks? So in a sense, if, I don't know if this exists, I should find out. If there was a Lego pick and mix, that would be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> Rather than these, I can sound grumpy and old, these newfangled kits with all these plastic palm trees and things. Back in the day, we had to build things out of little blocks. So if you wanted to give your child, your grandchild, your whoever, friend, um, you know, a proper Lego kit, you could go to the Lego pick and mix. You could get some long flat ones and some little skinny ones and some fours and sixers and you know as we used to call them my kids have you got a sixer oh, a red one yeah have you got a roof tile yeah a few little people and there you are you know so you put together this great level kit and if you were clever you could put together a kit that they could use to build a car a house a boat you know all sorts spaceship um you'd have to be careful you got the right numbers of different you know types of bricks there may be some you wouldn't really need to make anything um, maybe, probably quite a lot of these. <laughs> well, that's too slow, I think. And Stephen asked the same question. Have we got a really good building kit? In a sense, we've got different sizes and shapes of these amino acids, beads, chemicals, beads on the string, um, and different chemical properties, so they can do all sorts of different things and build all the different kinds of proteins. Um, so they did an experiment. Now, Stephen is a theoretical biochemist, so this was all on a computer. Um, they looked at the hundreds of amino acids that exist that are out there and they put the information about those into the computer. They asked, are there any other sets of 20 amino acids out there that could be better than ours, that could be more flexible, more foolproof for building a whole load of proteins in our bodies? Um, so they calculated that using the computer, uh, leave it on all night and let it do its thing. So they looked at 100 million sets and they only looked at three different chemical properties. They looked at size, electrical charge, because they have a little bit of a charge like magnets, and uh, how they behave in water. 
But there are lots of others, but they missed them out. They missed all the other ones out. You've got to simplify to do an experiment. And they found six sets of 20 that function better than ours at building proteins. Um, so does, does that mean that ours is not great? Well, they, I already said they simplified it. They only looked at three chemical properties. What if they looked at them all? The implication here is that it looks very much, from this computer-based experiment anyway, that the set of amino acids we have in our bodies is extremely highly optimized. Um, so what does that tell you? Well, is it a surprise? To someone like Stephen, actually, it wasn't an enormous surprise. It was really good to have that evidence, have that data there. It wasn't a massive surprise because you look out there at the universe, you look at one of the most abundant chemicals, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen. They're the stuff our bodies are built of. So we're built of the stuff that is floating there around there in the, in the universe. And those amino acids are arriving on our planet on meteorites all the time. If we, there was no atmosphere on the planet, and the atmosphere is created by living things, giving off oxygen and so, and so on, those meteorites wouldn't burn up on their way down to Earth, and those amino acids wouldn't be damaged. Um, that's a theory of how the amino acids arrived here on Earth, and how life developed after that. Uh, there are some clues about that, which I won't bore you with, but... <laughs> um, so those hundreds of amino acids were happening. Um, 20 in that process of the chemical origin of life and um, the, the formation of the evolutionary process, 20 were picked that were really excellent. The very best set for living life on a rocky planet with that was wet. Um, and uh, that's what you get. So it's not surprising in a sense that there is a set that is best because there are these constraints. An amino acid, a set of amino acids that doesn't interact with water at all is not going to be any use because life forms in a watery environment, for example. Um, so in a sense, you could say the origin of life was inevitable. It's going to happen. The chemicals were there. They were bumping into each other. Uh, life evolved. Life formed. Life evolved. The best stuff was picked. Um, so what is it? Why am I telling you this story? Because um, you might be wondering what conclusions I'm going to come to. There are these predictable properties. Um, Stephen thinks that if you took life, uh, if there is life on another planet, it might have a similar code, not exactly, might have a similar code to ours. Um, the question is, is this special? Is this a story about something special? Is this a story about something inevitable that's not exciting? Um, or is it both? The data isn't going to tell us. You could say, well, life was going to form, so why do you need God? Or you could say, I believe God exists. Isn't it incredible that he made a universe that is so friendly to life, that a planet that does have, you know, not too much gravity, but a bit, and lots of water, um, life can form, and maybe you will find life on another planet in our lifetimes. Wouldn't that be exciting? I hope so. Um, so the, the science isn't going to tell you what conclusion to come to. Um, so in a sense, I've burst the bubble of, oh, I don't know how life arose. Isn't it wonderful? I've poked a hole in that bubble and completely burst it. But I've given you a better experience of wonder, hopefully, that says, isn't it clever that life arose? Isn't it amazing that it's so highly optimized? Um, isn't it brilliant? Um, and then it's up to you um, to think about what questions that raises for you. Um, so I realise it's an unusual story. Um, it's not one you often hear in discussions about science and faith. Um, it's not often we're left with a slightly more, I don't know, what do you think? The questions aren't obvious. Uh, maybe some are, but not all of them. I'll leave you with Stephen's thoughts. Um, about what he thinks about the subject. Now, Stephen is a Christian, and he goes on to say that what he has seen in the scientific story makes sense um, in, in the light of the biblical story of creation. And uh, interestingly, he, he's not only a Christian, but a scientist himself. His father was, he, was, uh, he grew up in a vicarage. Um, his father was a biology teacher who retrained, actually a Methodist minister. They don't have vicarages, do they? Um, he was surrounded by science and faith from an early age. 
um, that has embraced them both. So those are those two stories. A story about beauty that makes sense uh, for a Christian in the light of the knowledge of God and also the inevitability of life. But I have two questions. What questions about meaning and purpose does this make you ask? Um, and uh, how do you make sense of science?